Hi, I'm your host, Larissa Worstiak. Through this podcast, I aim to empower and inspire jewelry entrepreneurs and professionals so they can thrive while adding more beauty to the world. I'm passionate about digital marketing for jewelry brands, and I'm excited to share my passion with you. As we all know, jewelry is joy, so I'll gladly seize any opportunity to talk about it. This is episode 179, and today I'll be sharing my interview with Jeff Mason, a photographer and gemologist specializing in product and jewelry photography. With 20 years of industry experience, he brings his knowledge of gemstones and his passion for photography together to best represent his client's jewelry and brand image. Jewelry photography is one of the top requested topics that I've gotten from listeners and viewers, so I'm very excited to share this episode with you and hopefully you will gain a lot of value from it. Jeff and I chat about things like the most important qualities of an effective jewelry product photo, tips for representing the personality of jewelry or gemstones in photography, overcoming the challenges of taking pictures of jewelry, and what a jewelry brand should look for when they're hiring a product photographer and how to know that they're hiring the right person, as well as how much you can expect to pay for jewelry photography. But before we get to the solid gold of this episode, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both an audio and video component, so you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. I love creating this content as my act of service to you, my awesome listeners and viewers, and you can always support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subs subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on iTunes, which helps other jewelry dreamers find it too. In this segment of the podcast, I give out my Sparkle Award for the week. So during this segment, I highlight a jewelry brand that's impressing me with their marketing. The Sparkle Award is also interactive, so you can visit sparkleaward.com to nominate a jewelry brand that's inspiring you these days, and I might feature your submission on a future podcast episode. This week's Sparkle Award goes to, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, Cohen and Cohen Jewelers, a brand that's really taken a fun approach to their marketing message as well as to their in-store customer experience. Founded by music and diamond-loving husband and wife duo Andy Cohen and Jen Cohen, this Wisconsin-based jeweler wants their customers to feel like rock stars when they walk into their store. With a wide-ranging soundtrack that plays at their store and even a food truck permit, their ultimate goal is to make their customers feel at ease when they come in and shop. They've also invited customers for to give input about curating a Spotify playlist, and they sell souvenir t-shirts that say rock your world. What's really cool is that Andy and Jen really trust their team and encourage them to be their authentic selves and let their individual styles shine. They don't even have any specific guidelines on what their staff should be wearing, and they're encouraged to wear whatever they feel good in. I love this quote. From the article, I believe it was an in-store magazine. Now I can't remember where I saw this, but this is a quote from Andy and Jen. They say, it's eclectic, but somehow everything we do is tied into a theme that says, we're not the same old, same old. People can see there is something different about us from the moment they see the contrasting angles of the exterior and then find a cohesive, clean, open, and energetic feel when they walk in. It's unexpected from the first look and that carries through with our way of interacting with our clients, end quote. I love it. I want to go. I want to check out this store. It sounds so cool. As I mentioned, you can visit sparkleaward.com to nominate a jewelry brand that's inspiring you these days, and I might feature your submission on a future podcast episode. Let's discuss some recent news related to jewelry or marketing. Each week, I share my thoughts about three relevant articles, and you can get those links by visiting joyjoya.com slash sign up. Once you're on the VIP list, you'll receive our weekly digest filled with new episode announcements. So the first article comes from later.com. I have been loving later lately for their really in-depth and well-researched articles 
mostly about Instagram and Instagram best practices. And this one was really informative for me. The title is Instagram introduces three major updates for reels. So these are the updates really important to know because reels are the thing that if you utilize them effectively will help you get the best engagement on Instagram. So one, they recently introduced a new 90 second Instagram reels length. So following TikTok's recent update to their to extend their video length to 10 minutes, Instagram has announced that Reels, once limited to 60 seconds, can now be up to 90 seconds long. You can do a lot in three minutes. This new update allows for longer video content, such as tutorials, demos, behind the scenes, etc. The second major update was Instagram stories stickers for reels. So the same stickers that you're able to use on Instagram stories, such as the poll, quiz, and emoji slider will now be available to use on reels. This presents opportunities for more interaction, new storytelling techniques, just making them a little more fun. And then the third update is the ability to import your own audio. So Instagram is likely trying to encourage more original audio on the platform. And this is a way to really get more creative and shine and tell your brand story through your Reels strategy. So a lot of new creative features for Reels. The second article comes from TheVerge.com and it is Facebook is changing its algorithm to take on TikTok leaked memo reveals. A leaked memo from late April obtained by The Verge revealed Facebook's plans to change their feed in response to the rise of TikTok. It seems like everything Facebook is doing, Facebook and Instagram, is just like a way to keep up with TikTok. So Instagram, as I mentioned in the previous article, has already made updates to Reels in an effort to compete with TikTok, and now Facebook realizes that the app needs some updating as well. So The Verge spoke with Tom Allison, the meta executive in charge of Facebook for more information. And he says, Meta realizes that to really compete with TikTok, it has to replicate the magical experience of TikTok's main For You page. And the leaked documents show that Facebook's user base is steadily aging with employees uncertain how to course correct the trend. So they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They want to keep up with TikTok. They see social media evolving in that direction. But also, they tend to have an older demographic using the app, so I guess they're wondering how can we do this in a way that will still appeal to to the older users. So here's a look at what's in store for Facebook and its changes. They're thinking that the main tab will become a mix of stories and reels at the top, followed by posts that the discovery engine is recommending from across both Facebook and Instagram. They're suggesting that Messenger and Facebook will be brought back together. Currently, the Facebook app has a lot going on if you've been on Facebook lately. So they're trying to streamline it and make it cleaner to use and prioritizing sharing content with friends and family. So again, the challenge is to like ad- adapt to these trends in social media while still making it relevant for Facebook and its user base. And then finally, the last article comes from New York Times and it's called It Works for Sneakers, Now It's for Baby PJs and Skateboards Too, and my side note, and probably jewelry. (laughs) So consumerism has changed as a wide range of retailers have found audiences are now much more receptive to product drops. So instead of releasing like seasonal collections, for example, brands kind of release one or two products at a time to keep people interested to always be on their radar. So limited edition product drops encourage people to shop more since there's always something new coming. And the idea that there's a limited amount of product draws in more shoppers so that they can purchase something no one else has. 
product drops are influencing people to buy now instead of postponing the purchase because they won't be able to buy that item at a later time and that gives it an element of surprise and scarcity. The brands featured in this article were not jewelry, but I think there's a lot to learn from them. So there, if you wanna check out these brands to kind of see how they release products, one was a baby pajama brand called Little Sleepies. Um, Mira, Miriam Weisskind, she uses the drop model to sell pies at breweries and street fairs. You can look her up on social media. And then Bear Walker, which is a skateboard company that releases one collection every six weeks. As I mentioned, if you want to get the links to the articles I share in this segment of the podcast, you can become a Joy Joya VIP by visiting joyjoya.com slash sign up. Okay, without further ado, let's get to my interview with Jeff and talk all about jewelry photography. My path to become a professional photographer was, I feel like quite unconventional. Like I, I was always told that I, you can never be a photographer. It's like, you never get paid, nobody gets paid. So it's like, why would you waste your time ever even trying? And so it was, like I played it around with photography in high school, but then it dropped off the radar because I wanted to make money and have a career. Yeah, and that's kind of depressing. <laughs> but I, I feel like it's, some of my being a photographer is just, what is my impossible? I mean, so we think of how many epic people are there in the world that do things that were impossible. And then you sit and it's like, well, what is mine? And some of it's just overcoming a lie. Totally. Because there's a the, lot of people. The that, stories that you tell yourself too. Yeah. And how many lies do we tell ourselves that limit us mentally? And because you say, I can never do that, then you never try. And if you never try, then you can never succeed. Uh, so I, I never tried. But that, it was until I got a job working for the TV show Pawn Stars. And then... There was always a film crew and I was like, wait a minute, these guys make a living and they have fun. Like they're enjoying their job and they always have cameras. Like this is a real thing. And then there was like a little click. And so I, I picked up the camera again. And then I, you know, it's like, I was really bad back then, back in those days. So that was <laughs> 2011. And then I just kept practicing and asking questions. I, I took a couple classes at the community college just be like, I can't seem to learn how to use the camera that I weigh the way that I want it to, shooting manual. And there's some very simple tricks with just shooting manual, trying to understand focus points, uh, focus stacking. It's, it's like, that never occurred to me that that was a thing back in those days. But then I just tried and it took 10 years. Uh, but still back in the Pawn Stars day, I just started playing with it. And then I had a friend uh, Irene Canavet, and she told me she told me about Robert Weldon, and she said that I should shoot jewelry because I was in the jewelry industry already, and that's when like my medium clicked. It was like, oh, I'm going to be a jewelry photographer. I'm going to try to be the next Robert Weldon. I love that, <laughs> and not really understanding the ramifications of that thought. Then it's like I can do this, and then I had a bunch of friends that believed in me. My friend, Annie, she was like, every time that I wanted to quit, she just happened to call. And then she's like, do this. And it's like, you're good. And it's like, I'm going to send you some stuff. We're going to have some fun. And it's like, kept pushing me. And then after like 10,000 hours, you got to put in your time. Exactly. Then I began to like my work. I mean, it's like asking anybody that I could for advice back in the day. Uh, within the last three, four years, it's like, I feel like, like it come into my own and now I work more well, actually it's even maybe even five years ago I started coming into my own but I I like my work and I get to play with some amazing stuff now so it sounds almost like the universe was like directing you to do this combination of the jewelry and the photography and you have a really amazing story of kind of like growing up in this industry can you tell our listeners and viewers more about it yes um I grew up mining turquoise my grandparents mined Bruno Jasper in Idaho. My parents owned a turquoise mines in Northern Nevada. And as much as I tried to get away from gemstones and jewelry and this industry, uh, 
I feel like it's fate that I'm here. Every time I try to leave, something sucks me back in. Uh, and now I just embrace it because I'm, I feel like I belong now. Uh, but yeah, from mining into jewelry photography. When I imagine like what it's how, what it's like to grow up in the mining space, like I picture a kid in a sandbox at a playground, but instead of sand, you're like playing with like tumbled <laughs> turquoise or something. Is that true? <laughs> I, I commonly, I was like, so I stole turquoise and I would play with it with my Tonka trucks and I would get in trouble. It was like, I remember when I was a really young kid, I just like, I took a whole ton and I, I did have a little sandbox and I just took enough so I could fill the Tonka trucks and then just like started building my own open pit mine. And my parents were like, you can't do that. <laughs> but I'm having fun. I love that. <laughs> what a unique way to like experience childhood, especially when you end up like continuing on in this industry and you have these like consistent memories of working with the rough material. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's spectacular. Every time I rock climb, I'm, I'm looking for veins of crystal. Like even if it's a thousand feet off the ground, I actually, I, I made my climbing partner pause. Uh, it was two weeks ago. There was a vein of rock. Uh, it was what silica or what do you call that? Uh, gypsum, selenite. There we go. There was a vein of selenite within sandstone. It's common out here, but I was like, it's so beautiful, and we're like 500 feet off the ground. This is so cool. And it's like just continue on, man. It was like we got, we yeah. Got <laughs> Only someone in the industry can understand yeah. that feeling. <laughs> so yeah. since you are so immersed in the jewelry product photography space, I would love for you in your perspective to tell people listening and viewing in your mind, what are the most important qualities of a jewelry product photo? Several steps. One is, is it, is it good? Right? Is it, is it technically correct? Right. It's like, that's, that's important. If it's out of focus, it's kind of a worthless picture, but uh, most important qualities, I want it to look dimensional to where you can pick it off the page. Right? There's something emotional about that. Uh, it needs to be alive and give an emotional response. I think that's, that's important. Uh, it needs to be technically accurate your white balance needs to be correct. The color of the gemstone needs to be correct, exposed properly. Um, and it was like, those are just the technical aspects. If you have camera shake, any of that, it just ruins the photo. Um, does the metal look like metal? Even though it sounds ridiculous, but that's, it, if you're shooting a polished metal, does it look polished or does it look satin? It's, it's easy to over diffuse. Um, what are your reflections like? And then at the end, did you, did you capture the personality of the piece or did you just look like a snapshot? Like it's not the personality thing is that's that last 10% because you can take an effective photo and miss the personality of the piece. And it's very difficult to get that last 10% of like, what does this piece represent? Like emotionally. Because when you look at it, and there was a large emerald that I photographed not too long ago, and it had a very beautiful, clean crystal, and it had a lot of light return out of the top, which is rare. But the color and the personality out of that was very difficult to capture. And that part of personality collecting is, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I would assume that that's why it's so important for someone, for a jewelry brand to work with someone who has experience working with gems and jewelry, because I feel like you need to understand gems in order how to get that like last 10% that you're talking about to really appreciate it yourself so that you can like communicate that through the photograph. Yeah. Otherwise it's so easy to over diffuse. And your gemstone, even though it may look like an even color throughout the stone, but it looks lifeless and impersonal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, look at Greg Christie's catalog. Beautiful pieces, but they, they focus on an even color. 
and not the life of the piece. If you see some of those gems in person, they, they have flashes, they have personality that's just not being captured. That's so interesting. I never really noticed that or thought about it, but I think I'm going to pay more attention to that from now on. How do you find that e-commerce product photography differs from product, other types of product photography, like for a catalog, for example, or for a lookbook or something like that? I don't think there's a large difference. For the most part, everything's going to be photographed on white for e-commerce versus a catalog. And I think I mean, like, as a photographer and as a businessman, I would try to utilize as much photography in the same space. So if I could have my catalog look uniform with the website, I would do that. And it's also you're spending less money on photography. Uh, the way that I first interpreted that question was it's like, it's gonna be a white background, which e-commerce because of Amazon has changed from more fun backgrounds, more styled backgrounds, and let's focus on just the piece itself so nobody gets distracted. But when you put it on a white background, you lose something. Uh, I, I always felt like it looks less real because, it, I mean, it's like if you're inserting like a pure white background, like you don't normally see that in nature unless it's completely blown out. So we're imposing a pure white background versus slightly off white and you lose a little bit of reality with that. But is that bad? No. So what would be your recommendation then if instead of like a pure white background? I actually don't have a, I mean, it's like, it's a drawback of pure white, but I would use it anyways, because it's very clean and consistent. And it does, it's like psychologically, it pushes, what are you trying to show? It's the only thing there. It's the product on a white background, whether that be dish soap or a million dollar piece. I mean, that's what's relevant is this is this is what we're selling. And it's so obvious that you can't mistake it. So Jeff, what types of jewelry do you enjoy photographing the most? Anything that's fun. <laughs> okay, I like that. Uh, I, I want to have a connection with the piece. And it's like, there's certain things that it's like, that is not relevant to money. And if it's, if somebody designed a really fun piece, and it's in silver, that's fun. And it's fun to photograph. If it's a well-cut gem, it's like, I don't like windows and stones. I'm a little bit of a snob. Like they exist and that's fine. But I completely nerd out over a well-cut gem. I nerd out over fun designs, rare pieces. Uh, I'm beginning to really love time pieces. Oh, cool. And I, have the opportunity to photograph some just wild pieces. MBNF is a brand that has just the coolest of nerd creative pieces. <laughs> and they're fun. Can you think of any other like memorable examples in recent times in terms of jewelry or fun, fun examples? You know, fun examples. Uh, there was a Jordan designs ring that, that I did recently that he's, a very creative know, benchman and it's fun it's like there's a lot of detail that goes into a piece like that that you can appreciate like there's azures that you really couldn't see unless you were really looking it's like that is interesting and fun for me because he really cared about the piece it's like anybody that. that anybody that spends that kind of time on something it's like there's something to appreciate and nerd out over and it's the fine details and it's like if you focus on the back of a piece it's like i can shout out a couple names but i won't do that but it's like some very talented artisans that spend the time in detail or they're just creative and it comes across and it's fun so you mentioned earlier about the importance of the personality that like intangible 10 percent I know it's probably like hard to explain how you go about capturing that, but do you have a, a process or like, how do you think through like how you're going to re represent that je ne sais quoi, as they say, yeah. of the, of the jewelry? Yeah. A lot of it's going to go down. Well, yeah, I, to capture the personality of a piece first, I pick it up. I look at it and it's like, what draws me into this piece or what does not draw me into this piece? Uh, 
am I taking a fine sapphire and moving it? And then there's one flash of light that he's just like, ooh, it's that one. I need that. Uh, it's looking at a fine opal and be like, you, you get the right color combination. Some of them, you get these beautiful red flashes. And for that opal, you're like, this, this is what I need to see. And then you're like, all right, now I, now I know what I want to show in the photo or Schiller in, a, in an organ sunstone. It's like, that's part of the personality. You need to capture that. And at that point, then you're like, all right, then it's like, I know what I want to see from this. How do I light it to create it? Is sometimes, I mean, you should see the contraptions that I use for diffusion. <laughs> I have three different thicknesses of material. I use reflected light, sometimes direct light, sometimes heavily diffused or really harshly diffused light. But it allows me to capture, is it gonna be an organ sunstone? Well, you need some, some kind of harsh light to show through to be able to pull that shiller out. If it's a dark gem, diffusion is just gonna blow out the facets. So it needs to be a reflected light. And then you can truly see what's in it. It's like a dark sapphire. It's like, you're trying to find, it's like, all right, how do I get the light through the front, the, the front of it without blowing out the star facets or any of the crown facets for that matter? So I can see like what's truly inside this gem. And as you're moving it under lights and, and like if it's a video at any one time, it's okay to have one or two facets that are pure white because that's how the light's hitting it. But I think in, in a photo, like you wanna do your best to not have them blown out because you're representing the personality of the piece and under that facet is something that's gorgeous. So you just mentioned some things that sound like very challenging about jewelry photography. Are there other things about photographing a piece of jewelry that you find particularly difficult that you wouldn't get from like, taking a picture of a hat or something like that hats are matte they don't reflect things <laughs> yeah well there might be some yeah. shiny hats out there <laughs> yeah, but like for the most part and it's like like a hat a shoe it's like you don't have to really worry about how hard your light's coming into it and then also if you put a ring on a countertop and you take a picture but you have dish soap sitting kind of off to the side and behind it it'll reflect into the front of it. It's like that you're photographing something circular. And it, it just, you need to be really concerned with all of your surroundings because you can have really obscure reflections. And also it's like, if it's polished, how do you have harsh enough light to make the metal look polished to where you see the contrast between light and dark? That's how you create the polished effect but then not be so harsh that the gym looks like crap. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a dance. I like or it. Sounds it very balance, challenging. But, <laughs> but it's enough to keep my ADHD mind in, engaged. And I, I can spend hours photographing one piece because you can always do it different and better. Do you have any other special tools that you use? You mentioned a different, different types of like setups that you have for light? Are there any other like very specialized devices that you use for, in your job? I build a lot of things. Uh, to hold my laptop, I, I built a special, uh, it's essentially a C-stand that I, I built a tabletop for. So I can move it up and down for my comfort level so I can sit, I can stand. Um, the same thing for what I set the jewelry on. I made it movable. That's important to me because if I'm shooting something that's laying down, like just for efficiency, it's like to switch between shots or if I'm doing earrings, it's getting, it needs to be at a different height. So I made a different table for the jewelry. Um, all my diffusers are made and I have several lot of different thicknesses of, it's a type of plastic. It's all photo plastic. It's like, but, you have very light and very thick, and then I have the mediums. What else do I have that's special? Like the tripod head that I have is very finely geared so that I can move it in fine increments. It's like, it's a very specialized tripod head. 
I also use a focus rail that's geared so that if it's a piece where the depth of field of the lens prevents the entire ring from being in focus, which often it does, uh, you do a focus stacking. And I prefer focus stacking because it gives, you get to see the entire piece for what it is. Like our eye has different depth of field than our, our lens does. And when you look at a piece, even if when you look at it and you're out of your periphery, the back of the piece is out of focus. But as soon as you look to the back of the piece, your, your eye automatically focuses. So what you're, what you're focusing on is in focus because that's how our mind works. But how do you translate that into a photo? So I focus that. Interesting. Full on nerd. <laughs> I think that you need kind of a nerd to like be, a, be a, you need to be a nerd in order to do the kind of work that you do. And I think that what I'm hearing is that people who are looking for a good jewelry photographer, they should be looking for someone who nerds out in this way. If you're looking for a jewelry photographer, so I'll be jumping in the next question. So yeah. segue. Sure. <laughs> That's my segue. <laughs> yeah. When you're looking to hire a jewelry photographer for your brand, like, you should be looking for somebody who's just good to start. But I think you're trying to find somebody that matches your energy. And I would almost say, do you like working with them? I mean, mm -hmm. most of what I do is based out of a relationship. People call me and if they didn't like working with me, they wouldn't call me. And it's about, am I receptive to their vision? Am I willing to, to work with them when like, I have this odd idea and it, or even if it's not an odd idea, but it's just something, could you change the color of this after it's done? It's like, I feel like this gem is 5% more green than it is in the photo. It's like, is your photographer willing to work with you for the way that you like to do business? Because we all have different personalities and we don't mesh. And I think that's more important than can someone take a good photo? There is a, like, there's a handful of jewelry photographers in the United States that are just spectacular. It's like from New York, LA, uh, Austin, Texas, it's like in Las Vegas, San Diego. How do I forget Sarah? It's like, but there's a, a lot of amazing photographers, but you want to find one that, come, that you like to work with. I think that's more important than, than can you take a good photo? It's so true. Yes. The same is true in marketing, I feel like, as well. Yeah, like, who is your team? It's like, when I was a gem buyer, I'm not going to source gems from a person that I don't like. Because life's too short to deal with people that are mean to you or <laughs> yes. just difficult to get along with. Yeah. Totally. So what do your clients like best about working with you? If, they, if I had someone on the podcast right now, like, what would they say about Jeff? Oh. I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> you can flex. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be because I'm really passionate about my work. It's like, I love to be a nerd. And being passionate and being nerdy makes me feel alive. And it's like, and if we go out through life and we're just doing the nine to five and we're not having fun and it's just a trudge. You're not alive. You didn't, you didn't live that day. But when you have something that captivates you, and it could be as simple as Uruguayan amethyst with the right red flash, and you're just like, oh, this thing is spectacular. And then you have an intimate moment with it. You remembered that day, and you, you were able to live for a moment. That's really inspiring. I like it. Now I want to just go play with gems. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it's this gym or the industry is supposed to be fun for us like oftentimes we forget that we live in a a, a world that's like this is not, not needed at all we need clean drinking water food shelter it's like this is all luxury goods that we don't need so let's make it fun i preach that all the time it needs yeah, to be fun because what's the point 
think if I'm going to work a job that like that, that I don't enjoy, then I might as well just be a computer programmer because it makes more money. Yeah. Or depending, you know, you, that's a very vague statement because you'd have to actually put in your first 10,000 hours for that before that goes there. But the point's the same. Sure. So one question that I get a lot from a jewelry business owners, especially when they're starting up and they are looking to make sure they have the right photography, like they don't know how much they should be expecting to pay for photography. And I know, of course, it depends on the skill level and like you get what you pay for, but is there a certain range that just so people know in terms of pricing expectations, what does something like this cost? If you pay per piece, there's, there's different ways to do photography. I'm just going to make it simple by the piece because there's a lot of us that do that. Somewhere between $40 a photo and maybe three to $500 a photo on the top end. Um, there's people in New York that pay, or the, that charge a lot, but they also deal with the, the finest stuff on the planet. Um, so somewhere between $40 a photo and I'm just going to call it $300 a photo. Cool. And that's, what are you trying to do? And that's for on white backgrounds. If you get into lifestyle shoots, it's like, that's usually a daily rate because you have a model and the model has a day rate and you have the person that your designer that does the fashion side of things. And then you have somebody that does hair and makeup. So those get very intensive, very fast. Does the cost for the product photography photography typically include like editing as well yes i think everybody that does a per piece is it's wrapped up into one it's just 40 dollars a piece or 55 dollars a piece and it's one angle edited photo mm. and then if you it's like some people do bulk, bulk discounts it just depends on your photographer for e-commerce do you have a recommendation about how many angles someone should have for a, any given product? I would say at least two. Um, if you're going by, uh, some people standards like the top down. So as if you're looking at the, at the ring, you're seeing the top of the gym and the sides. Uh, I call it the top view. That one's some people's hero shot. And then like a, a two thirds view, which is it's standing up and you can see the shank and you can see the diamonds uh, and then you can see the center like that's an important shot because it, it shows more of I'm gonna, more of what the ring looks like if you have a really inter intricate gallery then you'd want it either laying down or you want it from the side so there is some personal preference but uh, if i was going to create a website i would try to get the most consistency so it'd be like everything has a top view, everything has a two thirds view. And for this entire line, we're gonna do a through finger view just so everything's consistent. And then we have three photos per, per ring or two photos per ring. Yeah, that's really helpful. This has been so interesting. I feel like I learned a lot. I know nothing about like technical photography. So <laughs> I'm just like in awe and amazed. Um, is there anything else you would like to share with the podcast listeners and viewers? How can people find you? What are you excited about right now? What do you have on the horizon? It's your time to shine, Jeff. Uh, how people can find me is I'm most active on Instagram. And so even though the platform is changing, it's Jeff Mason Photography. Uh, my website's Jeff Mason Images because there are other Jeff Mason photographers out there. Um, but I find Instagram, when it started, was it's a platform for photography. And that was perfect. And that's where I get most of my clients from, if it's not word of mouth. It's like hang out with me in Tucson. That's, that's when things get fun. Yes. Um, and then what's on the horizon? I just did a massive shoot that took a week. And so a ton of editing is in my future. Mm. Which means which means lots of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be a blast. And the stuff that I photograph, I'm really excited to see the end product. That's cool. I love it. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast, Jeff. I so appreciate you sharing your insights and wisdom. It was so nice to have you. 
And thank you so much. What did you think? If you'd like to learn more about Jeff and his photography services, visit jeffmasonimages.com or follow him on Instagram at Jeff dot mason dot photography you can also always email me larissa that's l-a-r-y-s-s-a at joyjoya.com if you love this podcast please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it and don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on itunes to purchase a signed copy of my book jewelry marketing joy visit joyjoya.com book for more information